In this video, we'll look at how to succeed on the New York State U.S. History Region's short essay, Set Number 2, which is about reliability. This is for the new framework exam. In this video, we'll look at some pro tips for how to approach this part of the test. We'll look at some best practices, and we'll look at the rubric for how to get the best score possible. And then we'll finish by looking at an exemplar, an example essay, uh, and a student response. So as a reminder, there are three main parts of this essay, um, or I'm sorry, of this exam. Uh, this is part two, the short essay sets. There's a first set, which I already have a video about you can check out, and this is about the second one. So this short essay will include two primary sources. This could include something that's written, uh, could be any kind of like a letter or a speech. Uh, it could be a map, a political cartoon, a graph, a chart, a photograph, or a painting. They'll both be primary sources and you'll look at both of them and discuss both of them in this short essay. So if we look at the task that you will be given, it'll tell you that it's based on these documents, it's testing your ability to work with these documents, and what you really want to pay attention to here is these two bullet points. This is your task box. The first thing you'll be doing is describing the historical context surrounding document one and two, and then you'll analyze document two, probably, specifically, you'll do one of them, and explain how audience or purpose or bias or point of view affects this document's use as a reliable source of evidence. So when we zoom in on this task, my recommendation is to think of each bullet point of the task as one paragraph to write. You could fully meet the first part of the text in, task in one paragraph and the second part in another. Then you will know that you have fully met the task, which is one of the biggest parts of scoring. So task number one tells you to describe the historical context surrounding these documents. The word context, what that means is it's what's led up to what has happening in these documents. What is the background information of the topic and time period? So you're thinking about everything that's led up to this moment where you see these two documents in front of you. So in that paragraph, you'll want to discuss the who, what, when, where, and why. You definitely want to identify the time period. This can be specific or general. So if you know that you're talking about something related to the Cold War, for example, you could say the 1950s through the 1980s. You could name years or decades. Or you could say after World War II um, or before this, after that. That's another way to talk about a time period. But you want to give your reader, your grader, a sense of what time period we're really talking about relatively. And you want to name specifically the people, groups, events, ideas, laws that you can identify specifically. Think of anything you've ever been quizzed on, any vocab word you ever needed to know for social studies. If you know it in your mind, you want to write it down here. Um, or if you have the source information available to you, you want to use exactly what's in there to name the people, the events you're talking about. So you include any relevant outside information. And when I say relevant, I mean don't get far off task. Just because you know something related to the topic doesn't mean it has to do with the documents in front of you. So try to stay relatively on task. So when I think about context, I, I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine for a moment that an alien has come down from outer space. They have landed in the United States and they know nothing about our history, people, events, beliefs, nothing at all. So you need to sit this alien down and explain everything to them as if they know nothing. That's why you will name the time, people, groups, define everything. Because you're assuming they know nothing. That's good history writing. But avoid just repeating yourself or being vague, just taking up space, your grader can always tell when you're just taking up extra space. Be specific and use every sentence for a purpose. 
Again, don't get off track. You might know other things about the time period, but if it has nothing to do with the topic at hand or the documents themselves, then you don't want to go there. So that first paragraph is going to tell a story. It's going to sound like story time. You are sitting someone down and telling them the story of these documents. What does your reader need to know before the documents themselves make any sense? That's the background info. Then task number two. This is the harder part for this essay. This is one of the harder parts of the exam. You're going to have to analyze one of the documents, probably document two, and explain how audience or purpose or bias or point of view affects this document's use as a reliable source of evidence. So there's really two things you're being asked to do. You're clearly sourcing, you're practicing sourcing skills here by explaining audience, purpose, bias, or point of view, and you're then also talking about reliability. So that first thing, name the document specifically, be very clear. The photograph, the letter, the speech by this person. Use the source info that's given to you. So avoid just saying document two, because you're analyzing this as an actual document, just not just doc two. You're analyzing this person's thoughts or ideas. So you'd say something like a speech by so-and-so in the year whatever, or this cartoon from this newspaper. Be specific. And then you're going to cl clearly state whether the document is reliable or not. I would even recommend making it a topic sentence because it needs to be there. So like the examples below, you could say this document, this speech is a reliable source because it was written by this person, this author, who was this kind of person. Or this document is a reliable source of information for learning about this topic because the author's purpose was to... So see how in both those examples I've connected the source information, author, or purpose, with whether or not I think this is a reliable source. Make absolutely certain that the word reliable has come up in your response. So you're going to figure out if it's reliable based on, again, one of these four things, audience, purpose, bias, point of view. You need to make sure that you have definitely picked one to really talk about. If the others come up, it's okay. That's probably going to happen because you're sourcing and analyzing, but you need to be really clear about how one of them makes the document reliable or not. And here's a little secret. Any of these could be used. These are going to be designed that there's not a wrong answer. Certainly there is a way to argue that purpose or audience or point of view for any of these you can do well on this exam. There's not a wrong answer, but some of them are going to be better to use or easier to use than others. So as a reminder, what do these terms really mean? Point of view is an opinion. So you're thinking about what is this person's opinion who I'm reading on this topic and kind of like, should I trust them or not? And then there's also bias. Now bias and point of view are very closely related the way that this exam is using those terms is they're thinking that bias is one-sidedness. Because really every document has some kind of bias, but a truly biased document is going to be really leaning towards one way. Instead of presenting facts in a neutral way, usually you'll see something like this. You'll see some loaded language usually emotional language, exaggeration, propaganda, something that's overly positive or negative. You might see deliberately some information's included or excluded in order to support a particular interpretation of an issue, or it's really not a balanced argument. Or you might even see character attacks or slurs against a particular race, nation, or, or group in a society. Those are all indications that your source is particularly biased. Again, every source has a point of view and kind of a bias, but some of these sources you might encounter are really biased. Um, again, that's one-sidedness, 
Whereas if you're focused on point of view, that's more more objective. They're more neutrally telling you information to the best of their ability. Purpose, it's the reason this document exists. Why did somebody produce this source? Why does it exist? What's the intention? What do they want someone to do after they've heard the speech or read the letter? Why did they do this? Whereas audience is who's receiving this? Who was in mind? Why does this work document exist? Why does, or who does the author think would look at this? Does the author even indicate who the audience is? Something like a letter might have a very specific audience, where a speech might have an even broader audience, or a law is for everybody. Uh, so you want to think about who would have most likely been looking at this and how that would affect what the writer or the originator of the source, um, their reliability or not. So reliability, this is a tough one for students. I really think about these two questions. Is it true? what's in the document, and is it useful? So again, really biased sources, you might say they're not reliable because the way they're presenting the information isn't fair, it's not totally accurate. But here's a little secret. Basically, any primary source could be reliable. You can make that argument because it might be useful for learning about an author's opinion or attitude about a certain topic, or it might at least tell you more about that time period. You just have to be very clear that even if the author's words aren't accurate themselves, a student of history or a historian could use them to understand someone's perspective from that time period. You could recommend that they view additional sources with other viewpoints as well. So again, truly any source primary source, you can probably say it's reliable, but if you just say it's reliable because it's a primary source, that's not enough. What is it reliable for? What does it teach me? What, whose perspective am I getting about what topic? You know, what, again, why would you look at this in a history class? Why would a historian study this to learn? So to remind you about the most important parts here, to really met, meet the task, you should use evidence from the document. So somewhere in this short essay, you must mention both documents one and two. Whether you're describing how you know a political cartoon shows this, or this letter talks about this, um, but avoid lengthy quotations. This is not like your civic literacy DBQ. You really don't want to cite an entire quotation that's probably just taking up space and time. Um, but the evidence you might pull will be little, little words or a paraphrase or a short quote from those sources. So you do want to use evidence that show your reader that you obviously read and understood these documents, but don't put an entire giant quote in there. Just paraphrase or use small quotes to describe what's in those documents. Be really clear to source the document. Use the name of the author, the year, the type of source, etc. And make sure to analyze, either by making connections, using examples, or just doing the task in the second bullet really well. Use phrases like, as a result, because of this. Uh, yeah, that word because should be in there. That's how people know you're doing some analysis. So let's take a look briefly at the rubric. This is from the educator's guide. These are being scored out of five. We'll just look at the top score so you know what you're shooting for. A score of five thoroughly develops both aspects of the task, those two bullet points, by discussing the historical context surrounding these documents and explaining how audience purpose, bias, point of view, affects the use of document two as a reliable source of evidence. So both bullet tags or bullet points are fully done from the task. It's more analytical than descriptive. So it doesn't just repeat exactly what's in the source. It's making meaning out of it. It integrates relevant outside information. So all sorts of ideas that are not in the document, other things you knew about the time period, that should be in there. 
and it supports the theme with many relevant facts, examples from the document. So again, you're, you're proving that you understood the documents themselves and using um, information from those documents as you write. That's a score of five. So let's look at an example. Let's finish up by looking at this here. Here is an example of a short essay. So here, let's say I've been given these two documents. So what I should start doing is thinking about this, looking at the source information and thinking about what I know about this time period or these documents that I have in front of me. So I'm going to look at this first one. I'm going to look at the source information. I always want to do that. I see it's from the New York Public Digital Gallery. So that just means these photos came from an online database. And what am I looking at? It tells me that Lakota boys are pictured as they arrive at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, left, and three years later on the right. I'm going to observe. It's telling me to compare the two. Here's a before picture and after picture. So if I've done well this year in my U.S. history class, I might look at this and already know that I'm looking at an image of assimilation, of forced assimilation. If I'm lucky, I already know the Carlisle Indian Industrial School is an Indian boarding school where children were taken uh, forcibly from their homes, um, different Native American children, and forced to go to these schools where they were assimilated. I might know that many people saw these schools as abusive. I might know that they were forced to speak English. And basically the goal was to make them become Americans. Um, if I'm lucky, I also might know other things about this time period as well. But this one did not give me a time period. But when I scroll down to document two, I am going to find a time period. So I'm going to see the source information, which I'm definitely going to include in my short essay. This is from Richard H. Pratt. The year is 1892. So again, if I'm already kind of having some hints of what I looked at up here, and I know anything about those years, and I know anything about Native Americans at that time, other things should be coming to mind, like reservation systems or... Indian Wars happening out on the Great Plains as American settlers in the military got into conflict with different tribal groups out west. Those things, if I'm lucky, should be in my brain even before I dig into this source. So I'm going to see that these excerpts are from a paper read by Carlisle Indian Boarding School founder Captain Richard H. Pratt. So I've already found there's my, my part of my point of view. This is going to be who's talking. At the 1982 19th Annual Conference of Charities and Correction. So I know if he's giving a speech at this certain place, this is going to be my audience. So this, whoever is attending this conference is the audience for the speech. And hopefully I'll learn more about that as I read. So here is what Pratt said at this conference in 1892. A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. Yikes. And that high sanction or approval of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, that attitude, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. So I'm already noticing that he starts pretty strong with a kind of shocking statement. He's saying some people think the only good Indian is a dead one. He is not saying that. He's saying that there have been a lot of Indian massacres as a result of that idea. But he says in a sense he agrees, but only this part. And this is his most important part. This is his, his thesis, if you will. That all the Indian is there in a race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Kill the Indian and save the man. It is a great mistake to think that the Indian is born an inevitable savage. 
inevitable means it's bound to happen no matter what he was going to be a savage it's a mistake to think that he is born a blank like the rest of us left in the surroundings of savagery he grows to possess a savage language superstition and life we there's a reference to the source. We, left in the surroundings of civilization, grow to possess a civilized language, life, and purpose. So again, notice he's contrasting he, the Indian, has all this savagery. And we, he's including himself and the audience, have civilized language, life, and purpose. Now this is interesting. He says, to transfer the infant white like a baby little white child, to a savage surrounding, he will grow to possess a savage language, superstition, and habit. Transfer the savage-born infant to the surroundings of civilization, and he will grow to possess a civilized language and habit. So you should be seeing in this paragraph, he's building an argument. The idea that we are all born blank. And it, what it really matters is, is where you have grown up. When we cease stop to teach the Indian that he is less than a man, when we fully recognize that he is capable in all respects as we are, and that he only needs the opportunities and privileges which we possess, then the Indian will quickly demonstrate that he can truly be civilized and he himself will solve the question of what to do with the Indian. So if I've read this successfully, I'm understanding that his thesis, kill the Indian and save the man, he thinks that being an Indian is just part of your culture you've grown up with, but we are born blanks, meaning we can solve this problem of what to do with the Indian, because in fact, Indians are capable just as much as we, which in this case means white people, and he just needs the same opportunities and privileges as us. Okay. So, finally, let's look at an example, a really fantastic example of a student response. Um, not all of you are going to be able to do this well or have the time to write this much, but I want you to see some of the thinking um, that would go into a really, really high-level answer. So I'm noticing that the student's response is two paragraphs long. One is for the first task, one is for the second task. So I'm expecting to see historical context of these two documents addressed in this first paragraph. And I'm going to be looking, just like the rubric said, for some rich facts, examples, and details from the document and outside knowledge. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight whenever I see a piece of information that is an example of outside knowledge or source information, very specifically named. These documents are the results of many years of fighting between American settlers and in indigenous tribes. So the student is setting the stage of context by saying there's been fighting. When the U.S. began the process of westward expansion, it inevitably conflicted with many tribes of natives, some of whom were already pushed out of their prior lands by Americans previously. One way that the U.S. dealt with this was the reservation system. They forced natives onto reservations of land, land that nobody wanted, so that settlers could take the rest of the land for resources or farming. Many other natives were killed outright in battles with U.S. military troops. However, when the period of westward expansion was nearing its end, Americans still had to coexist with many Native Americans who lived on reservations or elsewhere. Around this time, boarding schools began to be created for Native Americans. Natives were sent or forced into these schools where they were assimilated into U.S. culture. This included cutting their hair, converting to Christianity, and changing from their traditional clothing as shown in the photograph of the Lakota boys of the Carlisle Indian School in Document 1. Oftentimes, or I'm sorry, often these schools abused or even killed the natives, and these natives were unable to fully assimilate into U.S. culture, but they also lost their old way of life 
so many were stuck in between and not accepted by either group. The information in the document provides some more context for the creation of boarding schools. So take a look at what the student has done. Context, you're thinking of that background info, who, what, when, where, why. Notice that the student gave us, they didn't name years, but they also still gave us a time period. They talked about westward expansion going on. Broadly speaking, that's, that is the time period. Um, they gave us this outside knowledge that there had been many years of fighting. They knew that before this, natives had been pushed out of their land before. Uh, they knew that there were reservation systems. They used that term. They talked about battles with troops. And then they used that term, which wasn't in the documents, of boarding schools. They specifically used the word assimilation more than once, uh, which is also a key term. Um, and then this whole sentence here is directly evidence from document one, describing what's in the photo. And then their outside knowledge about those schools. So this is a, a fantastic context paragraph. It's specific. They use their words well. It has their outside knowledge and knowledge from the documents. So let's look at the second paragraph. I'm expecting to see in here the student name a specific thing, whether it's point of view, bias, audience, purpose. And I'm looking for them to clearly say whether or not this is a reliable document. The author's purpose, there it is, for creating document two makes the document a reliable source of evidence for the historical context surrounding the creation of Indian boarding schools. Specifically, this speech was given by Richard H. Pratt. So she's named her using her source info for the purpose of arguing against forcing natives onto reservations and arguing for assimilating natives completely into American society and culture. Boom. It's no secret. Here's the purpose of the document. For example, ooh, I bet some evidence is coming. The document says that all the Indians in the race should be dead, which reflects the belief that natives should be forced into U.S. culture because it is viewed as far superior to their own. These people believe that natives should be removed from their savage surroundings and become civilized in American society. The purpose of this document is to support that belief. Again, she's talking about purpose. The document makes the assertion that native culture, language, and religion is savage and uncivilized and that they should be assimilated into U.S. culture as a method of ridding their old culture from the country. Therefore, it is a reliable source about this viewpoint, which provides useful context for the creation of the boarding schools. The student named what they were going to talk about purpose. They stated clearly in this topic sentence that they are going to prove it's reliable. They included all the source information. Here's the author's name. They put in their own words what the purpose of the document is, and they use several pieces of evidence from the document. So notice how this student didn't put some giant quote or half a paragraph in here. They just borrowed this phrase, all the Indian race should be dead, and what, it me what this phrase means. And see how they just use little phrases, quote, savage surroundings, and quote, civilized. So they just borrowed little pieces that really show that they knew exactly what the speech meant. They keep coming back to what the purpose is. And then this fantastic ending, they say that it's a reliable source about the viewpoint, which provides useful context for the creation of boarding schools. So the student is not saying that this person's words are all true. What they're saying about Indian culture is true. But the student is saying that it does help us learn about the creation of boarding schools. So see how you can take a source that if you read the source, it's clearly biased, but you can still say it's reliable because of that time period. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, good luck on your exam.